Welcome to the Information Security Training Program provided by Canyon ISD and Bushland ISD. This series of videos will cover eight primary topics of information security awareness. During these videos, we may mention software, services, or other tools that our organizations use. We are in no way paid to promote these products or companies, and the references herein should not be taken as formal endorsements. Please refer to your local administration or IT group to determine what tools and services are acceptable for you to use in your organization. This series is certified by the Texas Department of Information Resource, DIR. As of 2019, every state and local government employee, including education, is required per House Bill 3834 to complete this training every year. Once you've completed the training and quiz, you will receive a certificate of completion. You should check with your administrator in regards to if you need to submit that certificate or if the record they have in this system is sufficient to document your completion. Canyon ISD and Bushland ISD employees are not required to submit certificates and we will reference your completion in this system. Please make sure that you are using an appropriate organization email and that you are currently showing that you have registered with your organization. For instance, if you work for Canyon ISD, you should see Canyon ISD's logo on the left-hand side. If you see a logo with a lock, it is possible you've not registered with the organization and you may not receive credit for the course. So what is information security? The National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, defined information security as the protection of information and information systems against unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, or destruction in order to provide confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is so much more than just dealing with computers and email security or cybersecurity. We are dealing with a holistic perspective on how you handle all information. That includes written, spoken, and even digital. The world has drastically changed over the past few years. Technology as a whole is rapidly increasing in availability and growth of information is exponential. It is important to note that your information and the information of your students are valuable, profitable, and growing. Education is at the top of the list of vectors for attack against information security. The problem is most of us, even in IT, are not security professionals. Think about it. In Canyon ISD alone, we have over 10,000 student addresses, phone numbers, social security numbers, mother's maiden names, health information, interests, and much more. This is a virtual treasure trove for the threat actors that would love to get their hands on that information and any other part of data that they could exploit or sell. Listen, I know this training is long and it's not the funnest part of your day, but I hope you leave it with the same passion that I have, that we are keepers and protectors of the sanctity of the data that's in our care. Failure to protect this data can not only affect our organization, but also the persons who trust us to protect them against threats. Just look how far we've come in the last few decades. With the first introduction of the computer in the 1970s, incredible gains in the way information was digitized changed the way we functioned as a society throughout the 80s and 90s. We again saw a huge jump in the introduction of the internet. And further in the late 90s and early 2000s with the dot-com boom and social media explosion. Then around 2006, we saw the revolutionary jump with the handheld computer we now call the iPhone. And today, we are seeing even more technologies that collect, manage, and grow our data footprint. IoT, or Internet of Things, is becoming a daily staple in everything from city management, schools, farming, and even your home. 5G is taking the world by storm and will allow data transfer in ways that have been previously impossible. Google and Amazon are now listening to you in your home, and SpaceX has an agenda to launch a massive number of satellites into space to improve communication around the globe. Don't get me wrong, many products are great and provide incredible services. Canyon ISD and Bushland ISD both use Google heavily to facilitate incredible instruction opportunities for our students. So even though we love these products, we must be aware of the security concerns they cause and that can affect our lives, our organization's reputation, and the lives of our students. With high amounts of technology, there is an inherent compromise in personal security. For instance, when you put Google in your house, it has the potential to listen to and cater to your future searches and accommodate your likes and dislikes. 
I recently spoke with a security company whose primary job was to completely disassemble every component in a new technology and examine all security concerns. This company, who has a high level of government clearance and business contracts, said that there are very few, if any, electronic devices that are manufactured in a foreign company that are over $50 that don't have some form of tracking or monitoring software or hardware attached. Sometimes these monitor very simple ambient noises and alone don't give any relevant data. But when you tie them together with many similar devices, along with other tracking tools, you would be shocked to know how much information an organization can get about you personally. If an organization can get this type of information, you can be sure that threat actors or people who are after your data are actively looking at new ways to obtain that information as well. This can seem harmless, but many times the information you think is harmless is the very information that hackers and threat actors use over time to compromise your identity, passwords, and personal security. It's important that you remember that your device is constantly collecting and sending information. In fact, on my new phone, I was getting about half a day of battery life. I made some adjustments to the location services and removed apps like Facebook, Messenger, Twitter, and Snapchat. Now my phone lasts well into the evening on a single charge. Why is that? Because every app you download is constantly chatting with the owner, as well as tracking organizations like advertisers and other data collection services. Did you know the government does not consider the collection of metadata wiretapping? And it can monitor your metadata without a warrant. This also means companies can collect similar data. So what is metadata? It's basically defined as the what, when, where, who, how, which, and why of what you do. So it collects call records, location data, transaction data, this may not give an accurate depiction of information, but it does give contextual information. And when you put those together, it can paint the same picture as the actual data itself. For instance, you search the internet for bone cancer. You watch several YouTube videos on bone disease. You make a call to your mother that lasts a few hours. You take a trip to the hospital. Your phone is constantly tracking your location so it knows where you're going. You stay at the hospital for a few hours and then you go out and eat at a Chinese restaurant. Leaving the restaurant, you go to Walmart. This information by itself tells you very little about what's going on in your life. But when you add it together, as well as hundreds of other data points that you're completely unaware of, we have a very clear picture, not only of your day, your life circumstances, your food preferences, and possibly your future purchases. Maybe you do a Zoom call, and in that Zoom call, you have some flowers that someone sent you sitting behind your desk. And what you don't realize, in very tiny letters and numbers, you have your address information, and then you publish it on Facebook, or anybody else who's on the call can use special software to enhance those images, and now they can tell exactly where you live, not to mention all kinds of other contextual information that they can get from that call. I know we've all been in a situation where we've been talking about a product or searching something online and then suddenly all the advertisements start magically matching your interests. How do you think they get that information? It's from the metadata and from the information your devices collect. Now with all that said, if advertisers and the government use this data, why would we not think that threat actors and hackers would not be interested in, in obtaining as much of this information about your life as possible. Remember, the goal is not to quickly hack you. It's to build a treasure trove of data that makes hacking you later easier. Before we can leave this slide, I think it's important to show a video from the news that talks about a new surveillance initiative in China. This just gives you a small perspective of what's coming in the world and, how you and why you should be concerned. China is turning this technology to create a new form of credit that you need for things such as the ability to fly or buy food or even buy a house. While there is no current plans to implement this type of surveillance in the United States, we can learn about some of the dangers of this technology and how dangerous people can compromise our information. In some of China's largest cities, a high-tech effort is underway to bust low-level offenders, jaywalkers. Cameras record them going through intersections, zero in on their face, and then publicly shame them on nearby video screens. It's all part of the Chinese government's new social credit system, where people's daily behavior is monitored and rated. I think it's a good thing, this woman said. It makes people more honest. But this social credit rating goes far beyond a traditional credit score which is based on your finances. 
China's version factors in everything from jaywalking to smoking on trains to buying too many video games. If your score gets too low, you can be banned from buying plane tickets, renting a house, or getting a loan. In the interest of time, I'm going to cut that video short, but if you want to see the full video, I'm posting a link right at the top of this page. When we think about information security, you can break it down into what we call the triad of information security. This includes confidentiality, integrity, and availability, or CIA. It's important to remember this triad as it applies to the data in your possession. With confidentiality, we are seeking to prevent unauthorized access to the use of information resources. Integrity means we want to maintain the integrity of our information therefore prevent unauthorized changes and ensure the reliability of the information resources. Lastly, availability ensures that timely access is available for the appropriate people when needed. Threat actors want to breach confidentiality, disrupt integrity and resources, and alter availability. We will talk more about the methods they use, such as social engineering, phishing, and ransomware, later in a future video. With so many ways to be compromised, it's important that you understand some ways to protect yourself, your organization, and your constituents that you support. Things like viruses and malware, free and public Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and AutoConnect are all vectors of compromise. Following organizational procedures may at times seem tedious or unnecessary, but often help avoid dangerous situations. Above all, make sure that you are aware of the personally identifiable information you are in the possession of. This could be your information or the information of someone else, like a student. All of this type of information should be handled with the highest sensitivity. Even things like addresses or other seemingly harmless information can be a valuable resource for a threat actor. Be mindful of how you handle this information, how you transfer it, and how you secure it. Just to address a few of these directly, think of wireless security. How many times have you went to a Starbucks or a hotel and signed into the free Wi-Fi system? Did you know that you could be exposing yourself, your files, and your information to dangerous third parties without even knowing it? Many times when I do this training in person, I bring along a Wi-Fi pineapple. About the time I get to this slide, I look at the interface on the pineapple and I see how many people have connected. You see, a Wi-Fi pineapple is just one form of a technology called a honeypot. This essentially tricks you into thinking you are connecting to a legitimate Wi-Fi source. I can make it say anything I want to, maybe AT&T free Wi-Fi or Starbucks Wi-Fi. Once people connect, I can do all kinds of things, including track your information, hack your computer, steal your passwords. The best way to avoid this type of attack is to either connect to a trusted VPN provider authorized by your organization or not connect to the public Wi-Fi at all. There are similar concerns with public access to computing systems that may also have software that sends your keystrokes or data to unknown third parties. You see, when you use a computer that you don't have full control over, you never actually know what's installed. One other thing I found interesting from a real life hacker was that his favorite method of attack was to buy a bunch of cheap flash drives and install remote access software on them. This software, when plugged into a computer, would give the hacker full access to any machine so he may copy or steal any of the user's files without them knowing it. He would often take those flash drives and scatter them around a parking lot or a location near his vector of attack. Just for a side note, he was doing this legally as part of a penetration test for a company. When users saw the free flash drive on the ground, they'd come to work, they'd pick up the flash drive, and they'd stick it in their computer. It's just a knee-jerk reaction. Once they did that, the hacker immediately got everything he needed. No user interaction was required up to that point, just plugging the flash drive in. We'll talk more about other vectors of attack later, but let's talk about data services and software. It's important that we understand modern solutions such as the cloud. Popular cloud services include Google, Microsoft Azure, Dropbox, and Amazon. These are huge companies that employ highly skilled, qualified security professionals. We use many of these services personally and in schools, like Canyon and Bushland. We are under the G Suite for Education program, giving us enterprise level access to Google's flavor of cloud storage. So what about privacy, security, and sharing? The number one thing to remember when you store files or use software hosted by a cloud service provider, even if you believe they're the most secure service on the planet, is that you still have to understand you are putting your data in the hands of a third party. With these services, the data is normally encrypted, so even the company supposedly can't have access to your data and files. 
Whether you believe that or not, when you put the data in their hands, you lose a reasonable amount of control over the privacy of that data. Reasonable because you understand that because it no longer resides on a device that you own and control, you are trusting a third party to ensure the information is secure and safe. And you're trusting the transmission of that data from your location to them. We should never trust this with our most sensitive data. And in many cases, that includes personal identifiable information and social security numbers. Never store this type of data on the cloud unless it's encrypted by a special software that you or your IT department control. At Canyon ISD, we use SysCloud to encrypt data on the cloud. But generally, we encourage users never to store even semi-sensitive data on any cloud service if possible. And if we do store information on a cloud service, they go through a rigorous question and answer process to make sure we know how they handle our data. The provider is not the only thing we need to worry about. Let me give you a real life scenario that I've seen. A staff member uploads some sensitive data, such as addresses or personal pictures to Google Drive. Then they click share, but they didn't verify how they were sharing, thinking they were just sharing it with only coworkers or a friend. It made it public to everyone in the organization, both staff and students. So that means any student who was searching for something that might match that data or that picture could pull up all that information. You must be very careful how you share with other people using cloud services. The same feature that fosters collaboration also opens the door to accidental compromise. Also, make sure that the people and groups you are sharing with still have the appropriate members. Maybe you're sharing with someone who is part of a special ed group. And next year, the teacher is no longer involved in special ed and no longer has the right to view that confidential information, such as 504 data. If you forget to remove that person from the shared group or list, then you may have inadvertently broken FERPA laws by giving confidential access to an unauthorized personnel. What about security and privacy? Make sure you read all the privacy policies in terms of use. They're there for a reason. Your failure to understand these policies is not an excuse for data compromise. Does the service offer two-factor authentication or is it only a password? And last but not least, are you using a strong and unique password to access the cloud system? It doesn't matter how secure your cloud provider is. If your password is weak, threat actors have an open door to your entire environment. It doesn't matter how well you share things. At Canyon, we block a lot of products just because the third-party app or extension doesn't follow good guidelines and shares data with third-party vendors. These are education-related companies, and they violate laws like COPA and FERPA. We don't authorize these third parties to have access to data, and therefore we don't authorize the companies that share that data to have access to our system.